Chapter 7, Cell Structure and Function. We're going to begin Chapter 7 with the discovery of the cell and the cell theory. The discovery of the cell began with the development of the microscope, which was becoming, beginning to become of age during the uh, 1500s, early 1600s. And our knowledge of the cell begins with a British scientist named Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke in 1665 used a very simple early compound microscope to look at cork cells that he had trimmed off the cork from a wine bottle. And this is, his exa this is an example of his microscope right over here. He used a flame as his light source because they didn't have electricity so he, should not, he would not have had a light bulb. Uh, the flame would have been focused, the light from the flame would have been focused by these lenses down on the object which would have been right here. And remember this is a compound microscope which means that there will be two lenses. This is the objective lens which would be closest to the object and this is his eyepiece or the ocular. And he would have focused it by moving it up and down using this screw. Now when he looked at his cork cells, he, when he trimmed it, basically what he used, you guys ever been to Arby's and you see one of those uh, meat slicers? He basically took a wine cork and put it through that meat slicer. And he got a little sliver that looked like this. And he saw all these little empty boxes in there. Now we know today that these empty boxes are just the remnants of the cell wall from the plant cells. But to him, they look like the tiny rooms that a monk would live in in a monastery. And these tiny rooms were called cells. So he called these things cells. And that name just stuck. So the reason that we call cells cells today, if that makes sense, a living cell is called a cell because of the word that Robert Hooke used when he was looking at his cork cells. The next gentleman in the development of uh, what is a cell is a man from Holland. His name is Anton von Leeuwenhoek and in 1674 he used a very very simple microscope to look at pond water and this is an example of his microscope over here. It's essentially just a magnifying glass. The lens is right here. He would put a drop of water on the end of this pen and he would use these screws to move the pen in or out, up and down to bring it into focus. Now the beauty of this microscope compared to this one is the simplicity of it. Leeuwenhoek could actually put this in his pocket, go out into the field, to the pond, put a drop of water on it and view it very simply. There's a lot more stuff to carry and set up if you use Hook's model. Now, when he was when Laban Hook was looking at his pond water, he saw all of the neat stuff that you guys saw in the pond water. He would have seen tiny little ciliates, which would fall under the protist group. Uh, the kingdom protista is essentially the junk drawer of biology. If you're not a plant, if you're not a fungus, if you're not a bacteria, uh, if you're not an animal, you fit in the protist kingdom. Uh, the protist that he would have seen would have been like a paramecium, which moves by cilia. These are collectively known as ciliates. Ciliates, I should say. That should be an A. Uh, he would have seen various insects. Uh, he also would have seen crustaceans, like the water flea, whose scientific name is Daphnia. Uh, if you were to collect pond water, uh, you would probably see all of these things again. Now he was not aware of protist, so he simply called them animacules, tiny animals. They were moving around and they were just swimming. Now I always try to envision what was it like for Leeuwenhoek when he saw these animacules for the first time. And think about the first time that you saw uh, protist in pond water. And, and then that look of amazement, you would have said like maybe, ew, or whoa. This is what this gentleman would have said in 1664. He would have looked in through this microscope and he would have saw the pond water organism and he would have been stunned. He would have been amazed. He saw stuff swimming in the water. This is what he drank. This is what he cooked with every day. Just kind of amazing stuff. All right, moving on to the cell theory. The cell theory was developed in the first half of the 1800s, and it was done by a combination of the work of three scientists. The first one in 1838, Matthias Schleiden. He stated that all plants were made up of cells. Basically what he did is he had looked at enough plant tissue and noticed that every single one of them were made out of cells. Therefore, he felt that it was safe to assume that all plants were made out of cells. A year later, 
Another German scientist named Theodor Schwann stated that all animals were made of cells. Same idea with him. He had looked at enough animal tissue and noticed that there were cells in every single one of them that he decided that it was safe to say that all animals were made up of cells. Now, a great way to remember the difference between these two guys, Schwann sounds like the word swan. And remember, swans are animals. So Schwann animals, they're all made of cells. I always remember this as Schleiden, you slid or you slide on the grass. Grass is a plant, so all grass is made out of cells. So Schleiden plants, cells, Schwann animals, cells. The third guy, about 15 years later, uh, Rudolf Rochelle, he stated that all cells came from pre-existing cells. Now, if you can remember from a previous chapter, when we talked about biogenesis, remember life comes from other living things, this fits really well with that statement. The only way a cell is created is it has to be made from a pre-existing cells. And remember, that is going to be done through a process called cell division. And cell division comes in a couple of flavors. The first flavor is mitosis. During mitosis, the cell is going to go through a process called prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, PMAP for short. This is your basic cell division where one cell divides into two. If you're going to create sex cells for sexual reproduction, you're going to go through a process called meiosis. Meiosis is very similar to mitosis, but it's going to produce gametes. Uh, the male gamete would be the sperm cell, and the female gamete would be the egg cell. Meiosis is designed to create an increased amount of genetic variety so that when a sperm cell and an egg cell get together, you're going to have a new set of genes. Uh, and genetic variety is the raw uh, material for evolution. All right, getting back to the cell theory. You basically, if you take the work of Schleiden, Schwann, and Verschau and con condense it into a single item, you're going to get to cell theory. The cell theory has three parts. The first part is all living things are made up of cells. The second part is closely related to number one. The second part states cells are the basic unit of structure and function in living things. You can take number two and you can say this. The cell is the basic unit of life. Items number one and items number two in the cell theory are basically a combination of Schleiden and Schwann put together. If all plants and all animals are made up of cells, it's a safe assumption that all living things are made up of cells. And in fact, if you would look at protists, if you would look at fungi, if you look at bacteria, they are also made out of cells. So that makes this basic unit of life uh, term to be appropriate. Now, another thing that you want to remember is, if you're not a cell, you are technically not alive. So a virus would not be considered a living thing because it's not made up of a cell. The third and final part of the cell theory will be pretty much just for shall, word for word. New cells are produced from existing cells. In other words, the only way you get a new cell is you have to either do mitosis or you use meiosis to produce the gametes that will be used for sexual reproduction. Uh, that will conclude this podcast on the discovery of the cell and the cell theory.